Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third lecture podcast in modern Europe. Today, we're going to be doing the big event, the French Revolution of 1789. This is the point. This is the demarcation point that where most historians would say that the modern world begins. And so it's pretty exciting. And there's lots of blood, guts and gore. There's tons of fun stuff to cover. So sit tight and let's learn about the French Revolution. The learning objectives for this unit are articulate the reasons for the French Revolution. Recognize the three major stages of the French Revolution. And finally, describe how the French Revolution influenced the Western world. So this brings us to the main event, the French Revolution. The French Revolution, for most historians, is a major event. It's a turning point in history. It's usually what is the um, sort of dividing line between the early modern period and the modern period. In fact, some might argue that we're still living in the period that the French Revolution ushered in the modern world. So what you see here is an image, a painting of French soldiers marching off to war during the French Revolution. Um, the French Revolution lasted nearly 20 years, and it was marked by near constant warfare during that time. And when those wars were happening, French citizens would be um, called upon to join in on the fight, not because they were um, uh, forced to as subjects, but rather as citizens, as their responsibility as citizens. And this is one of the big contributions of the French Revolution is this concept of nationalism. And this is an infectious idea. It begins first in France, but it spreads everywhere as people transform from subjects into citizens. So the French Revolution, um, we're going to uh, take a look at the basic narrative structure of what happened during it, but we're going to see how Enlightenment ideas get twisted and turned. We're going to see it take its uh, very bloody course during the Terror. So let's get started. So before we talk about the French Revolution, I want to talk about one of the major precursors to it, and that's the American Revolution of 1776. The American Revolution was, in many ways, an Enlightenment-inspired revolution. When you think of some of the foundational documents of the United States, such as the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, those are all essentially Enlightenment documents. When you read those documents, you hear echoes of Metesca, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Voltaire. As such, the American Revolution really did set the precedent that Enlightenment-inspired political change was real, that it could actually move from simply being something that people talked about in coffee shops to something that was affecting real change. The American Revolution, of course, was when the 13 colonies of Great Britain rebelled against their mother country and, against all the odds, actually secured their independence and created the first modern democratic nation, the United States of America. Now, ironically, the, one of the reasons they were able to do it was because of the support of the French monarchy. The French king uh, sent lots and lots of money to the American revolutionaries, and this was partially what allowed them to stand up to Great Britain. Now, the irony, of course, is that uh, uh, the American Revolution would, of course, inspire the French Revolution. One Enlightenment Revolution led to another. So let's talk about French society, um, where the revolution would actually take place. So earlier on in this podcast, we talked about how French kings had become all powerful, that they were absolutist kings. That means that they pretty much could do what they wanted. The thing is, is that, you know, French society had changed in many ways, like the rest of Europe had changed. If you recall, during the Middle Ages, we had three groups of people generally. Everyone fit into one of those three groups, the nobles, those that fought, the uh, clergy, those that pray, and the peasants, those that work. Um, and then we saw this new group of people emerge during the Renaissance, and that is the townsfolk, the merchant class, or the middle class. And that certainly had happened in French society too. But legally, they were still stuck in the Middle Ages. So legally in France, you were a member of one of three groups. Everyone was. They called them estates. The first estate was the clergy, those that pray. Approximately 130,000 uh, people were the first estate. The second estate was the nobility, those that fight. 
350,000 people were roughly uh, a part of that. And the third estate was the vast majority. This is the commoners, those that work. The thing is, is that by the time we get to the French Revolution, the third estate is far more complicated than that. It also includes very, very wealthy, very wealthy merchant class people, uh, people like, um, you know, who are producing Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire. Um, the third estate, in some cases, is is, is got wealthier people than the nobility. Uh, so the third estate is not a homogeneous group. It's a large group of people. And legally, the first two estates have privileges that the third estate doesn't have. Um, and this is what creates this sort of unfair uh, tipping point in French society. So here you see a cartoon here from, uh, from that time period where you see the common people being crushed by privilege. So you see the first two estates, the nobles and the clergy, uh, stepping on a big heavy rock and poor third estate guy is being crushed ah! underneath that rock. Uh, so here you see another cartoon where the poor third estate um, has got on his back uh, the um, rather rotund um, noble and a member of the clergy as well. And together they're riding on top of the third estate. So, you know, obviously um, these cartoons are demonstrating that a lot of people in French society thought that this system was completely unfair. So what was it? What was the straw that broke the camel's back? What actually ended the, what they call the ancien regime, which uh, just means the old regime. So what actually brought them into crisis? So there are uh, several factors. First of all, um, heavy debts. Um, so France had gotten into tons of debt um, uh, during the American Revolution by supporting the American revolutionaries. So the king had borrowed a lot of money. And kings before, at this point, it's Louis the Sixteenth. So two kings after our friend Louis the Fourteenth that we talked about in the early podcast. But ever since Louis the Fourteenth, kings had been borrowing money to go to war and and build huge palaces like Versailles. So there was quite a bit of debt. Now, the problem was, is there wasn't much of a means to collect money to actually pay that debt down. It was a very antiquated system of collecting revenue. Under this system, the wealthiest people, the nobility and the clergy, didn't pay any tax at all. So the third estate paid all the taxes. So obviously that is an unsustainable situation when you have tons of heavy debts. The other problem is that there was all these entrenched noble privileges. Uh, so nobles um, had um, power in many different ways. So first of all, they were part of the few um, checks and balances on, on absolute kings. So in France, they were a member of the Parlement, which we talked about earlier in the podcast. And the Parlement was sort of a law co co court that interpreted the king's rules. Um, and the third estate just had none of these privileges. The uh, third uh, factor was that this is the center of the Enlightenment in France, and there was a lot of public opinion that the only way to solve the problems of French society was radical change. And uh, France being the center of the Enlightenment, where philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau were talking and spreading ideas, meant that France, French society was ripe for something like a revolution. And number four, the final factor which leads to the tipping point of the French Revolution is in the summers before the French Revolution, there was a series of very bad harvests in the year before. Um, and just because of weather patterns, there was not a whole lot of food to go around and the price of bread skyrocketed. And so there were people literally starving in the streets on the eve of the French Revolution. And this was the match that would light um, light the fire of the French Revolution. So here is the king who was uh, in control of France at the time. So it's not Louis the 14th. We're a couple of Louis down the line. This is Louis the 16th. And Louis, uh, you know, I, I don't think he was a particularly uh, cruel king or anything, but he was certainly a king that was out of touch with the problems of his country. And he really um, handled the crisis very poorly. He didn't really know how to react. And most of his decisions actually made things worse. Uh, 
his wife often, um, his wife, Mary Antoinette, um, often gets a bad rap as well. Um, a lot of the propaganda during the French Revolution painted her also as very out of touch. Um, there's a famous phrase uh, associated with her that when she was told that the price of bread was uh, so um, expensive that peasants couldn't buy it, she said, well, if they can't afford bread, let them eat cake which was meant to show just how out of touch she is. We don't think that Marie Antoinette actually said that. We think that was just propaganda that came out during the French Revolution. There's zero evidence to suggest that she actually said that herself, but um, she was certainly associated with this completely out of touch, noble, privileged class. So in the summer of 1789, we have um, people starving in the streets. We regularly have bread riots. Things are starting to get pretty bad. And even the king recognizes that something needs to be done. And so he turns to a man named Jacques Necker, who was a banker from Geneva, and he made him his finance minister. Now, Necker is an interesting fellow. First of all, he had actually written some Enlightenment writing himself. He was a strong believer in a constitutional monarchy. Um, so not maybe the obvious choice to appoint into a position, um, but he was willing to try some radical things to try to solve the problems in France. And so what he advised uh, Louis the 16th to do in the summer of 1789 is something that hadn't been done in nearly 200 years, and that was to call the Estates General. Now, the Estates General, uh, if you recall, we talked about it very briefly at the beginning of this podcast. The Estates General was a representative body that had no real power, but perhaps if uh, the king could get the Estates General to agree to some sort of radical um, changes, perhaps to the taxation system to allow the taxation of nobles or the clergy, then he would be able to move ahead with something that um, uh, otherwise he might not have been able to do. Even absolute kings, there's a limit to what they can get away with. And when it comes to taxing and getting rid of the noble privileges, that was one of the limits of what even absolute kings would find themselves uh, hard-pressed to do that. And so Necker convinces him to call the Estates General. Now, the Estates General, uh, the way it works is it has representatives from all three estates of French society. So there's representatives from the first estate, the clergy, the second estate, the nobles, and the third estate, which is everybody else. Now, the way that votes happen is each uh, estate gets one, essentially, vote in the Estates General. Now, the problem of this is that um, the first two estates are obviously always going to outvote the third estate. So any radical changes, um, they're always going to overturn. And in, and in this instance, their self-interest, um, that they didn't want to be taxed, they didn't want any uh, major changes, meant that the estates general didn't end up doing anything. And almost immediately, it fell into bickering and arguing, and uh, it just was not going very well at all. Lots of arguing. And so the third estate, um, it, which in this case was made up of a lot of fairly well-educated, uh, merchant class level um, enlightenment thinkers um, began to essentially take matters into their own hands. They declared that they were the true voice of France and that they renamed themselves the National Assembly. At this point, we are looking at uh, a fiasco, really. And the whole idea of calling the Estates General, uh, which had been Necker's idea, um, is looking really, really foolish. And so the king tells Necker, shut it down, shut it down. And so the next day they organize troops to come and bar the doors to the assembly room so that the people can't get in. Now, this is one of those pivotal moments in history where the French Revolution might not have happened. Um, except that the National Assembly, or that third estate, decided that being locked out was not going to stop them. So on June 20th, 1789, the National Assembly, as it's now calling itself, has found itself locked out of the assembly room where the Estates General is being held. There are troops barring the door. So what do they do? This crowd of people they decide to walk down the street and they find the first open building that they could get into. And as it turns out, it was an indoor tennis court of the Kings. And they went inside and something remarkable happened. After much talk, they swore an oath that became known as the Tennis Court Oath. And they said that they would not rest until France had a new constitution which declared equality for all people. 
This is the beginnings of the French Revolution. So needless to say, things are not going good for the king in the summer of 1789. The idea of holding the Estates General turned out to be a really bad decision from his point of view, and so one of the first things that he does is he blames it all on Jacques Necker, the man that he had hired to try to solve his problems. The thing is, is that Jacques Necker was actually really popular amongst the people. And once um, word got out that Necker had been fired, that really is the spark that uh, blows everything up. And from June 11th onward, uh, Paris and other places uh, start to essentially um, um, become ruled by mobs. Um, on July 14th, the center of royal power in Paris, the Bastille, which was a uh, fortress um, and a prison, and it's also where all the armaments and the guns were held, uh, was stormed by crowds. They uh, broke open the gates, they executed the commander, and seized all the weapons. Usually, the storming of the Bastille on July 14th is truly the beginning of the violent revolution. This is where things begin to uh, turn completely against the king. Um, there's si simultaneous wave of uprisings across the countryside and in different cities in France, and eventually even the French king, the king's soldiers, begin to join uh, this new um, uh, mob militia that forms, and the French Revolution is fully underway. So after the storming of Bastille, the king technically remains. He's holed up in his uh, palace of Versailles, um, uh, pretty much uh, powerless. He, over time, begins to lose more and more of his power. Essentially, the country is now being controlled by the National Assembly, the, the group of the Third Estate who had taken the tennis court oath. Um, the National Assembly uh, begins to keep its word. They had sworn an oath that they would find, a, uh, they would draft a new constitution for France, and they were true to their word. The Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen is a really interesting document. It's there's a um, section of it that you can read in your textbook. In it, it essentially um, does away with all of the old noble privilege in France, the abolition of feudalism, and any of the privileges of the first two estates makes people equal under. The the law um, and in many ways is, is similar to the American Constitution um, that came out of the American Revolution. So as we've seen in the summer of 1789 things took a dramatic turn for the worse for the French monarchy. Now the problems that led to the French Revolution they haven't gone away. People are still starving in the streets. In October 5th of 1789, so just a few months after the storming of Bastille, there was a large crowd of women protesting the scarcity of bread. That protest ended up being joined by various um, other groups that were around in the city, and the crowd swelled by many, many, many uh, fold. And that crowd eventually spontaneously decided to march to Versailles to confront the king directly. This became known as the October March or the Women's March on Versailles. The crowd was so large that the king's guards were powerless really to stop them. And the next day, the crowd compelled the king to return to Paris. So this is where the crowd of people forced the king to return to in Paris, the Tuileries Palace. The Tuileries Palace had been built in the late 16th century, but it hadn't been the main residence for the kings of France for some time now. Compared to Versailles, it was rather drab and old fashioned, and certainly it wouldn't be where the king would choose to be with his family, right in downtown Paris on the banks of the Seine with essentially a rabble rousing revolution going on right outside. From now on, the French king would essentially be under house arrest. Over the next two years, as the National Assembly started working on the Declaration of Rights and Man of Citizen, as things started to look really, really bad for the future of the king, you can imagine that he started to get very nervous. About two years after the revolution, the king, who had been under house arrest, tried to do something about it. So in 1791, two years after the revolution, the king, aided by some friends, along with his family, dressed up as peasants and tried to make a run for the border of France. The so-called Flight to Varennes almost changed the course of history. The king made it nearly to the border when he was recognized and arrested in the small town of Varennes. This would be uh, a humiliating defeat for the king, and things would turn much, much worse for him now. The king and his family were forced to return to Paris, but this time the crowds weren't cheering, the crowds were angry. 
And in many ways, this was a bad turn of events for the king because in the National Assembly, a certain percentage of the assembly were reasonably friendly towards the king. They hoped that there would be some form of a constitutional monarchy, something similar to what existed in Great Britain. But with the king trying to escape, this gave the radicals all the ammunition they needed to be able to say, the king is against the revolution. The king wants to kill us all. The king wants to stomp down on this revolution. And the radical faction essentially began to get more and more powerful. So now I want to talk about the increasing radicalization of the French Revolution from 1791 onward. Uh, there were essentially two main groups that really turned the French Revolution in a violent and radical uh, direction. The first group I want to talk about is the sans-culottes, and you see an idealized image of a member of the sans-culottes there on the left side of your screen. The sans-culottes were essentially working class men. Uh, these were the men who formed the bulk of the uh, militias that were um, keeping order to an extent on the streets of Paris and elsewhere in France. It was uh, the sans-culottes who essentially were the people who had stormed Bastille and who had taken all the weapons from there. Now, they essentially acted independently. They didn't really have a central leader or anything like that. And certainly the National Assembly really couldn't tell them what to do. Um, and they ended up being responsible for a, a lot of the violence of the French Revolution when it started to turn for the worse. They're known as the sans-culottes because of what they wore. Uh, culottes, and you see in the center there, this is a cartoon making fun of the king um, in 1792, an etching of Louis XVI. Um, and he's being made fun of because he's like ringing the revolutionary bell as if he's a revolutionary. But of course, you know, he was under house arrest and all that. Anyways, the culottes are those pants that only go to the knees and then men would wear tights underneath uh, them uh, to their shoes. Culottes were essentially worn by everyone above a certain social standing. So it would have certainly included uh, men of the upper middle class, people like Voltaire, uh, people uh, who were deputies at the National Assembly, um, who had attended the um, uh, Estates General, they all would have been wearing culottes, but not working class people. They wore pants. And so they were without culottes. So in French, sans culottes means without culottes. So that's the basis of the name. The other group I want to direct you to is the Jacobins. The Jacobins uh, leader was Maximilien de Robespierre, and you see an image of him there. Uh, the Jacobins were, um, these were educated men. These were men who were from that upper bourgeois class. Uh, they certainly formed a large faction within the National Assembly, uh, and they were from the Third Estate. Uh, and it was certainly from them that we start to see a more institutionalized radicalism, and eventually, which leads to the terror. The Jacobins uh, derived their name from where they met, in the Jacobin Club on the Rue Saint-Jacques. Uh, the Rue Saint-Jacques was where a monastery had been in the Middle Ages. And so it was there that these men who were steeped in Enlightenment ideals um, debated and argued about uh, the direction that the French Revolution should take. So you can imagine that if you were a king somewhere else in Europe, you would be watching what was going on in France with utter horror. I mean, this was just an un heard of scenario that the people would rise up and throw off their king and treat him in such a terrible fashion and so there was mounting pressure from outside of france for other countries to step in and do something to save the king or to stop this revolution uh, the first countries to organize were austria and prussia austria obviously felt additional pressure because marie antoinette the queen of france was from uh, the austrian royal family in 1792, Louis XVI, still under house arrest and under duress, meaning he didn't get a he didn't get a choice in the matter, was forced to declare war on Austria as Austria was uh, organizing their troops for an invasion of France. From this point onward, foreign war would be a factor in the French Revolution all the way until the very end, until the defeat of Napoleon in the 19th century, and as these wars were fought. The people that fought in the wars, the people who joined the army, they would be joining as citizens to the French army. And it's really in the crucible of all this fighting that the concept of nationalism really begins to take hold. By the summer of 1792, now three years after the revolution had begun, 
France was now at war with Austria and Prussia. Uh, society was under an incredible amount of stress. Um, and on August 10th, um, an armed mob stormed the palace of Tuileries and placed the king uh, under arrest and his family was imprisoned. He was marched from the palace to a prison uh, where he would spend the remainder of his days. By September, the National Assembly had declared itself a republic and officially removed the king or stripped the king of all of his power. We also see in September an incredible wave of violence, mostly perpetuated by the sans-culottes, as nobles across the country were imprisoned, some were executed, um, some who were in prisons were broken out and killed without trial. This became known as the September Massacres. In the fall of 1792, the king was put on trial for treason and he was found guilty. And in January of 1793, a point of no return, Louis XVI was marched up onto the platform in front of a crowd of people. And there, Louis XVI was executed by a new apparatus, the guillotine, which became a symbol of the French Revolution. So with the trial of Louis XVI and his execution in uh, 1793, uh, from, from the fall after the king is imprisoned in 1792 onward, we really see the revolution take an increasingly radical and violent turn. The Jacobins assume more and more control over the National Assembly, which is renamed the National Convention. Uh, one of their first targets was the church, the first estate of France, who uh, were seen to be uh, anti-revolutionary and a relic of the past and did not uh, uh, properly embody the ideals of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. Um, the um, National Convention began to take a direct action against the church. Uh, first, monasticism was ended, so monks and nuns, no more. All monasteries were seized by the revolution. Um, churches were stripped and rebranded as temples of reason. And also, the calendar itself became changed. Uh, a revolutionary calendar was imposed, which was thought to be much more uh, rational and reflective of Enlightenment ideals. Uh, rather than 12 months, we'd have nice even number of 10 months. All Christian feast days were eliminated and months were renamed under uh, Greek and Roman words. Um, this was, uh, again, to associate itself much more with the rational ideas of the Enlightenment. So, for instance, um, the month that was roughly corresponding to summer, uh, July, August, was renamed Thermidor, which was um, from the Greek thermon, which means summer heat. But it is the terror which runs from 1793 to 1794, which was ushered in by the execution of Louis XVI and wouldn't end until thousands of, of French people from across the country would be put to death under the guillotine, where political opinion or even the semblance of political opinion became a matter of life and death. This is what most people think of when they think of the French Revolution. So Marie Antoinette would also be a victim of the terror. Um, that's an image of her execution in October of 1793. So just several months after her husband was beheaded, uh, she also found herself beheaded as well. But it wasn't just kings and nobles who found themselves victims of the terror. The terror would affect regular people as well. Uh, the terror was organized by perhaps the worst named committee in history, the Committee of Public Safety. Uh, the Committee of Public Safety was responsible for determining who was anti-revolutionary. Uh, people were encouraged to rat on their neighbors if they felt that their neighbors were not sufficiently supportive of the Jacobins and the, um, and the direction that the revolution had taken place. The leading member of the Committee of Public Safety was none other than Maximilien de Robespierre. That's the fellow I showed you a picture of in an earlier slide. Maximilien de Robespierre is really one of those truly evil people in history. And really, he was responsible alone for many, 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 many people being uh, put to their death in his quest for power. Um, so we see public opinion become a matter of life and death. And we think approximately 16,500 people would be executed by guillotine before the terror ran its course. However, eventually the Jacobins became victims of their own success. Uh, famously, um, uh, Maximilien de Robespierre stood in front of the National Convention at one point towards the end of the terror, and he was holding a list in his hand. And he said, on this list are names from this very chamber. 
meaning that, you know, there were names that he was going to essentially pass on to be executed. And of course, everyone in the National Convention thought that their names were on it. Well, that was the final push. And the National Convention essentially grew tired of the terror, fearing for their own lives. And they finally got up their courage. Soldiers were sent to arrest the Jacobins. And it all comes to an end. So I'm going to tell you about the uh, downfall now of Robespierre, and you might want to fast forward through this part if you're a little bit squeamish. But uh, I suppose in many respects, Robespierre got his just desserts. So he knew that the soldiers were coming for him. He knew that he was likely going to be arrested and he planned to not be taken alive. According to one story, he tried to commit suicide with a pistol when the soldiers were still just downstairs in the building that he was in. However, he missed, and rather than um, shooting himself in the head, he blew his jaw off. And then he was in utter agony during the night. They uh, had to tie his jaw to the rest of his skull with a handkerchief. He couldn't speak. He could only scream all night as he was bleeding and in utter agony. The next day, of 1794, Maximilian de Robespierre was led up to the guillotine where he had sent so many thousands of people himself, according to one story, um, as he was put onto the board and slid underneath the guillotine, the handkerchief holding his um, half-severed jaw to his head fell off, his jaw essentially detached from his skull, and he screamed out in utter agony as the blade came down and ended Maximilian de Robespierre. Don't say I didn't warn you. You needed to fast forward through this part. It's, it's kind of gross. So after the terror, the National Convention um, and France reorganized itself one more time. Uh, so now with a new constitution, they, uh, the government of France was renamed the Directory. The Directory begins in 1795 officially, and this new constitution was meant to limit popular power, hopefully to make sure that we never have another terror again. Um, under the new constitution, executive power, rather than it being um, held by just one person, a body of five directors who'd be changed every three years would act as the executive. However, the problems that were underlying um, the French Revolution that France had been dealing with ever since it began really hadn't gone away. There were still shortages of food. The foreign wars continued to go on. Um, and the government, the directory, was threatened by destabilizing forces on either side. They had the, the remnants of the Jacobins on the left who wanted to overthrow them. And on the right, they had people who were still royalists who wanted to see uh, France return to um, a, a monarchy. Um, for example, um, one internal uh, war that they had to deal with was the War of the Vendée, which was a royalist uprising that was suppressed by, by the government in uh, 1796. And so the, the government of France was really uh, very unpopular and it was uh, increasingly reliant on military force to maintain order. And then along comes this fellow, the rise of Napoleon. So the first thing you need to know about Napoleon is that he's not French. He's Corsican. Uh, Corsica is a little island in the Mediterranean, and they don't speak French in Corsica. They speak Corsican. Um, however, Corsica had been taken over by France um, some decades before. And uh, Napoleon had been uh, born into a poor uh, but, but noble family. And his father wanted to see him succeed in life. And so as a young boy, he was sent to France to go to military academy with the sons of other French nobles. So there you can imagine young Napoleon would have really been considered an outsider, but he would have learned French and he would have done his best. Now, had the revolution not taken place, it's likely that Napoleon would not have climbed very high in the ranks of the army. He was not the son of a French nobleman. He was an outsider. He probably would have stayed in the lower ranks. However, given that war was an omnipresent fact during the French Revolution and Napoleon was, without a doubt, um, a reasonably skilled tactician, also um, a, a, had a lot of luck as well, if we're being honest, um, Napoleon uh, began to rise through the ranks. And this young general, as he eventually became, um, had a string of quite a few successes. He started to become one of the few bright shining lights back home. We, um, the directory would regularly publicize all of his exploits. He became uh, a bit of a hero for his campaigns in Italy and Egypt. And in many ways, Napoleon and his armies began to turn the tide of foreign war. He was immensely popular back home. 
And now this, of course, is uh, laying the foundations for his eventual uh, coup d'etat. Uh, he plot with, plotted with several other members of the directory to seize control in November of 1799. Um, and of course, immediately um, after that, he turned on the, his fellow plotters and seized uh, complete control on his own. So by 1804, Napoleon had declared himself emperor. So France had gone from having an absolutist king to an emperor uh, just a little over a decade later. Um, Napoleon, of course, though, still um, the way he presented it is that he was still the embodiment of the revolution. He said the revolution is me. In many ways, uh, things settled down after Napoleon comes into power. He imposed stability and reform, and he did follow through on some of the ideals of the French Revolution, such as um, instituting equality under the law. So the idea that you would not have nobles anymore, that, that all French people would be considered equal under the law. Um, he also at least had a semblance of democracy that he had uh, plebiscites, which are like referendums, um, and he would have these occasionally that people could vote in. However, uh, the, um, uh, the results of these plebiscites, let's face it, they were always foregone conclusions. Napoleon was not really playing around with real democracy at all. Um, and in fact, in many ways, he maintained his power by being an authoritarian. He cracked down on anyone who might uh, be against him. He imposed very strict censorship of what people could say. And he loved having paintings of himself. This is just one of many, 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 many paintings of Napoleon uh, looking all sort of, you know, um, moody and, uh, uh, you know, debonair. Uh, by the way, it's a myth that Napoleon was short. We think he was actually of average height. The myth comes out of propaganda from the British who essentially wanted to present him as uh, a diminutive man. Uh, but we don't think Napoleon was actually short. So that is a bit of a myth. So Napoleon um, and his armies were able to completely turn the tide then of foreign war. And over time, Napoleon would eventually assert control over the entirety of the continent of Europe. I mean, essentially, Napoleon achieved what hadn't existed since the time of Charlemagne, a united Europe. Um, there are two key battles that I want to point uh, your attention to um, just because of their consequences for later on. The first of those battles is the Battle of Trafalgar, which was a sea battle in 1805. Um, and this was a, a loss for Napoleon. Um, it, it, it was a loss to the British. And the reason why I bring it up um, is twofold. First of all, um, it ended Napoleon's plans originally to invade Great Britain. Originally, Napoleon was planning on doing that as well, but uh, his defeat at Trafalgar um, confirmed for him that the British had a superior navy to him. It also marked the beginning of British naval supremacy, supremacy, which would essentially not change until the end of the World Wars. Uh, Britain would um, rise to become a superpower of sorts during the 19th century. You know, the sun never sets on the British Empire and, you know, Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. That's because they really did rule the waves. Um, so from 1805 onward, Great Britain is the most powerful country on the sea. The other battle I want to point your attention to is the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805. Um, by the way, you can see these two battles here if I grab a little pen here. Here's Trafalgar down there. Yep. And uh, Battle of Austerlitz, it's right over here. The Battle of Austerlitz uh, cemented French power on the continent. So from this point onward, pretty much uh, Napoleon controlled uh, mainland Europe. So what are the consequences of Napoleon for then the next almost 10 years controlling uh, most of Europe? Well, um, he spread reform wherever he went. In many ways, the ideals of the French Revolution that he did institute, things like equality under the law, became the norm. Uh, the idea that there wouldn't be nobles became the norm. So that reform laid the seeds for change all the way through Europe and it would bubble over a half century later in the revolutions of 1848 and ultimately would lead to um, universal suffrage where everyone has a vote. Um, all those changes would happen partially because of Napoleon's conquests. Um, he called um, the countries that he conquered that would then sort of be subservient to France as sister republics and he instituted an economic cohesive uh, trading unit of all of mainland Europe that was called the continental system. This is essentially the precursors to the EU today. Um, notably outside the continental system was Britain, just as Britain now is outside the EU again, once again today. <laughs>
The tide turned for Napoleon when he made a foolish mistake of trying to invade Russia in 1812. Now, if you know your history, invading Russia is never a good idea. Um, now, the part of the reason why he invaded Russia is because he was pretty sure that Russia was going to declare war on him and he wanted to have the upper hand. But there's also a fair bit of hubris in there as well, too. Um, the Russians have a very simple uh, strategy for dealing with invaders that they have used time and time again and they used it again here and that is that when a foreign army comes in russia is first of all a very very big place and the main strategy is to let them come in you retreat you retreat deep into russia along the way you make sure that they are the invading army is not going to find any food or supplies so it's best to burn all of your fields burn all of your towns and leave nothing for the invading army and that's exactly what napoleon uh, found as his army came in they went all the way to moscow with very little um resistance and then the Russians waited for winter. And when the winter set in, the French army was in no way prepared. They did not have supplies. And that is when the Russians attacked. And as Napoleon and his army was forced to turn back uh, in defeat, the Russians fought them again and again and again, picking them off. The weather continued to pick them off as French soldiers died from the elements. Um, we think that at the start of the invasion, uh, Napoleon's army um, um, was numbered around 685,000. By the time he uh, left um, Russia, it might have been only as much as 100,000 troops, which is really, you know, pretty, pretty crazy to say the least. So uh, Napoleon finally is defeated by combined European force. And lucky for Napoleon, I suppose, he wasn't uh, actually executed or anything like that. Uh, he was forced to abdicate from his throne and he was exiled to this small little island called Elba in 1814. Now, you would think that that is the end of Napoleon's story, but it wasn't. Napoleon managed to escape from that little island, come ashore, uh, rally some of his old troops, and he briefly returned with an army, but all of Europe had pretty much had enough of him. The French had had enough of Napoleon at that point, and he was finally defeated for the last time in Belgium and Waterloo in 1815, and then they exiled him again, much further away, and France returned to having a monarchy. Louis XVIII, uh, this is the brother of Louis XVI. Now, Louis XVIII had managed to escape from France prior to everything turning really, really awful. And he was invited by the reigning powers, the European powers that had defeated Napoleon, to return to France, to become the king, and to restore France to the way that it was before. The reason why he's called Louis XVIII, as, as opposed to Louis XVII, which you'd think because he's the next Louis um, uh, in the line, is because um, uh, his brother had had a son um, who, had he lived, he actually had died uh, while in prison during the French Revolution, the little boy, um, had that little boy lived and grown up and become king, he would have been Louis the Seventeenth. And so his uncle, out of respect for uh, the fact that his nephew um, was denied his rightful place as king, took on the title Louis the Eighteenth um, out of respect. So you could be forgiven for thinking, what's the point? And the French started with a king and they ended with a king. Was there any legacy whatsoever to the revolution? Well, the truth is, is that things would never be the same. Uh, although a Bourbon, Louis XVIII, did return to the throne, uh, they would not uh, be a king of France for that much longer. And by the end of the 19th century, there would be no more kings of France ever again. Um, really, this permanently ended the idea of absolutism in France, and everywhere else monarchies were forced to change. Constitutional monarchies would now be the norm. Even Louis XVIII, when he um, was offered the throne um, by the victors after the defeat of Napoleon, wasn't just simply offered to go back to doing what his brother had done, being an absolutist ruler. No, the victors recognized that that was no longer possible, and France adopted a constitutional uh, monarchy from that point onward. And even that wouldn't be enough in France, as you'll see if you take the second half of this course, Modern Europe, you'll see that France will lose a king altogether by the end of the century. Um, it also demonstrated very clearly that the ideas in the Enlightenment were serious political forces. This was not just coffee shop talk. 
these were um, forces for change. We'd seen two major revolutions, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, which had completely transformed the balance of power. And we would see during the 19th century, the ideals of the French Revolution overturn governments everywhere. Eventually, by the time we got to the 20th century, we would see universal male suffrage, meaning that every man has a vote of who they want to be in government. And eventually, we would see women join them a few decades later when we have universal female suffrage as well. The word suffrage just means the right to vote. Um, this would also institute the birth of nationalism. So nationalism is such an ingrained concept for us. It's very difficult for us to imagine a time before nationalism, a time when we were subjects, not citizens. But now nationalism would be everywhere. And because nationalism is a nebulous term, how you define a nation is different for different people. Is it a shared geography? Is it a shared language, a shared ethnicity, a shared religion? Everybody has different ways of defining it. It meant that people all over Europe and eventually the world would essentially decide for themselves, hey, we want to create our own nation. We want to direct our own future. What this meant was for large empires like the Austrian Empire or the Ottoman Empire, they would begin to lose their cohesion and eventually this would spell their doom. They would never be able to um, uh, bring together all these different groups of people again because nationalism had destroyed that um, ability. We also, as I said, with the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, we would see uh, the British become um, the uh, most powerful navy on the seas. And this would mean that during the 19th century, uh, Britain would be by far the most powerful country in Europe. They would only be challenged really um, for that power once a Germany becomes a country and is united at the end of the 19th century. And of course, that rivalry between Britain and Germany would eventually boil over into the First World War. And also the French Revolution inspired revolutionary movements against colonial rule as well. Um, one of the most notable examples in, is in one of the French colonies, a slave colony, Haiti. In uh, 1791, they began a revolution of their own, inspired by the same Enlightenment ideals, and they eventually succeeded in um, becoming the first uh, slave colony, former slave colony to become an independent country. And elsewhere in the Caribbean and Latin America, we would also see uh, revolution inspired movements against colonial rule. Overall, the French Revolution would change everything. And from the beginning of the 19th century onward, we are really into a new era, an era that historians call the modern world. All right, so that is it for module one of Modern Europe. We're now really starting to move into the course. In our next unit, which will be the first unit of module two, we will be exploring the industrial transformation of Europe. Till next week, everyone.